Hi, everyone. This is Suzanne Simon with Restore America's Estuaries. We're going to go ahead and get started with this month's Living Shoreline Community of Practice webinar. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Restore America's Estuaries, we are a national organization dedicated to the protection and restoration of bays and estuaries as essential resources for our nation. Um, and for folks who have not been um, a part of one of these virtual gatherings, as we call them in the past. The intent is not only to provide some much needed information through our focus topic, but also an opportunity for folks to stay connected. Um, so as we proceed through this hour or so, um, if you have a question or a comment, um, go ahead and using the control panels of your webinar, raise your hand virtually or submit a question and I will ask it on your behalf. Um, this is definitely meant to be um, as interactive as you would like it to be. As a reminder, everybody is on mute. Um, so again, you'll need to uh, raise your hand virtually and then I can unmute you one by one. Um, some housekeeping, all of these are recorded and will be posted on the Ray YouTube channel. The older ones are posted. Um, I'm still catching up a little bit on some of those, uh, but they are a fantastic resource, so be sure to check those out. All right, since you're here, you already have this agenda, but I'll review it again. We'll go through some quick national updates, regional updates, um, and then we'll uh, pretty quickly head into the, the focus topic with Annie Roddenberry. Um, and again, during any of this time, uh, you are welcome to, uh, like I said, raise your hand, ask a question, submit a comment, something along those lines. So um, one of the things I will do a quick report out on the national level, um, we are just coming off of the National Living Shorelines Workshop in North Carolina. It was a great success. Thank you to those of you who were able to make it. Um, and we are working to post the presentations and posters and a summary report will be forthcoming. So stay tuned on those fronts. I know a lot of people um, had questions about either presentations that they missed or if they were unable to attend at all. They, they definitely wanted to um, reap the benefits uh, remotely. The other thing I'd like to do from an organizational standpoint is to introduce Hillary Stevens, who is our new Coastal Resilience Manager. She will be leading our new program that will combine both living shorelines and blue carbon elements. Um, I will still be at Restore America's Estuaries. I am simply going to be transitioning into some new responsibilities. Um, and by way of introduction, uh, Hillary is a geologist and environmental scientist with extensive experience in coastal resource management. She has worked on coastal issues here in the U.S. and around the world uh, with a particular affinity for island communities stemming from her time working in um, a variety of places in the Pacific, including time as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Philippines. She holds a master's from Yale and a BS from Wesleyan. So um, her email address will be popping up uh, on the very last slide. And so please uh, make sure that you reach out to her and say hello. Um, and she will be taking over responsibilities for the community of practice. So you will definitely be hearing from her. Okay, so with that, I will, I'm checking in with you all to see if there's any regional updates or questions from or for the group. Again, use that control panel on your webinar software to raise your hand or submit a question. Here we go, question. Ah, this is a comment. From Farah Alami, the first of Florida's Living Shorelines training course for marine contractors will take place in St. Petersburg next Monday and Tuesday. They have a full house with, of 32 plus several on the waiting list. That's great, Farah. Fantastic. Congratulations. And um, we have already talked about um, uh, Farah perhaps giving a, a full report out um, once 
the training is over in terms of seeing how it went because I know it's a it's a training that a lot of people are interested in um, for marine contractors in terms of living shoreline. So um, very excited to hear about that. So congratulations, Farah, and to everybody else who's been helping on that effort. Any other comments, questions, hand raising, questions for the group? All right, hearing none. It is my delight to pivot now to the focus topic on non-plastic alternatives for oyster restoration. What's going on? Uh, one of the things I will say um, is that this topic was a big, big um, conversation starter at the North Carolina workshop. There was a, an entire breakout session, not necessarily just on oysters, but on living shorelines in general. So I know that there's a lot of interest in this. So. I am delighted to introduce Annie Roddenberry, who is a biologist for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Uh, her focus is restoring and enhancing aquatic habitats in Northeast Florida, such as oyster reefs, salt marshes, mangroves, artificial reefs, living shorelines, and SAV communities. She works closely with a broad array of partners and currently serves as the chairperson for the Northeast Estuarine Restoration Team an active working group of restoration practitioners, who, by the way, are doing fantastic work there in Florida. Um, along with her habitat restoration work, Annie has built successful community-based programs to involve public and private sectors in oyster recycling, water quality testing, outdoor education, and environmental monitoring. So with that, I will hand over the screen to Annie. Take it away, Annie. All right, thank you, Suzanne. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you and we can see your screen. All right, let me get this sorted out here. All right, so thank you so much for uh, having me on here as the featured speaker and for giving a great platform for this discussion. As you mentioned, there's been a lot of interest in the topic of non-plastic alternatives for oyster restoration, and I've been really blown away by the response to um, just sort of some some queries amongst the community about this topic. So this presentation was born from many conversations with colleagues about what's going on, you know, what are people trying, what's working, what's not. We don't always hear about people's failures, and sometimes those are really important. So the purpose of this presentation is um, is really informational. So it's a representing a tremendous body of work from a lot of different people. I'm very appreciative to everyone who sent me summaries of their project and pictures and updates. Um, so I've tried to capture as much of that as possible. Um, I know I haven't included every project out there, but this is really just to get your gears turning and, and to spark some ideas uh, and also to communicate as I mentioned, what's going on and um, what's the latest, how can we move this forward as a restoration community? So I borrowed uh, a little bit from one of my favorite Marvin Gaye songs for this this title. And, you know, we've got to find a way to bring some oysters here today. I'll spare you all and not sing it, but um, but that's where this title came from. So many of you who do oyster restoration know that we rely heavily on um, plastic materials in many places. This could be oyster bags. These are the Naltex mesh bags or aquaculture grade. Uh, it's a stable material. Uh, they typically are used to contain loose shell material and stabilize shorelines or rebuild a reef, um, you know, create a breakwater scenario. And this has been successful in a lot of locations uh, and in various applications. There's also plastic used in oyster mats. This is a, a very successful technique used in um, Skeeto Lagoon in Florida, um, developed by Dr. Linda Walters at University of Central Florida. And these mats are used as sort of a quilt that covers over a, a dead margin area and stabilizes that site at the appropriate elevation to restore that oyster reef. As we learn more about the impacts of plastics on the marine environment, we've increasingly started to ask ourselves, can we do this without the use of plastic? What are some of our other options? Um, you know, can we explore different materials? What are the trade-offs of these materials? You know, the, the plastic is fairly inexpensive. Um, it creates community involvement opportunities. 
uh, you know, logistics are fairly straightforward, and um, but but these are things we need to be thinking about with some of these other alternatives. Uh, what else can we be testing? And what has shown promise in some regions that we might want to try elsewhere? And uh, I hope that this presentation, um, again, just kind of sparks some ideas, makes you think about trying something in your site that maybe you hadn't thought of. So this is meant to be a catalog of efforts from restoration practitioners. It's primarily focused on Florida, but I have some projects from other areas. Uh, and, and I've organized it by material, and we'll go through you know, where these materials are being tested and what those results have been so far. Uh, in many cases, these are relatively new, so results are pending, but it's exciting to see what's kind of coming down the next year or so as far as um, uh, research on alternative materials. So again, this is a huge body of work from dozens of partners, and I really hope that this presentation continues to evolve and change as we learn more uh, and try new things. The first material that I'm going to talk about here, you may have heard of, these are bees units uh, or bees mats. They're biodegradable elements for starting ecosystems. They've been used very successfully in the Netherlands for muscle restoration, and they're made of potato starch material. So this is a byproduct of chip factories, and so it's a waste material from um, another industry. And it's molded into these like interlocking sheets. They have a lot of nooks and crannies and they can be adjusted um, according to your need. Uh, the height of them can be adjusted. And they typically come in a meter by a half meter block. Uh, we've also cut them in this, uh, in this picture here to be half meter by half meter. So we've tried a number of applications around the state, you know, putting them on directly on the sediment in the intertidal zone, um, hanging them under docks, putting them, uh, creating mats that mimic that um, Naltex mash mat material with oyster shell attached to them. Um, and what we've seen is that in some areas, there's been some really promising results. So in Cedar Key, there was excellent oyster recruitment, uh, great oyster growth. You can see that, that matrix underneath those oysters, um, but lots of oyster coverage there. And in Vero Beach, where they were hung under homeowners' docks with some oyster shells attached to the outside, the idea is that oysters would kind of colonize these units and then they could be removed from under the docks and transplanted to another location, sort of like reef building blocks. So this was done um, several months after they were put under people's docks. There was some really good growth you can see here. And then those units were moved to another site. Uh, so there's some potential there. Uh, they had some good growth on the bees and, and are going to be trying that um, to a number of other sites. That particular site had some challenges with wave energy, but it was more the conditions there than the, than the material itself. At other locations, these really did not have promising results. Uh, in um, Charlotte Harbor, after a year and a half, the bees had no recruitment and became really brittle and broke off their stakes. Uh, similar results in Volusia County, you can see them nestled between some living oysters here, but after a year and a half, there's really no, no recruitment on, on those bees. And then in this top right picture, this is in the um, GTM Research Reserve up in Ponte Vedra, and you can see in the lower part of the picture are these metal gabions with recycled oyster shell inside, and then just above them are the bees. And there's just, these, have, these were deployed at the same time, um, right next to each other at, at the same elevation, and you see tremendous oyster growth on the gabions and, and no settlement on the bees whatsoever. So um, these are all low to moderate energy intertidal sites um, and just really didn't see a lot of success with these materials. We're trying a few other applications that uh, the jury's still out in, at the Florida State University Coastal Marine Laboratory. Uh, they have hollowed out the bees and put in some loose oyster shell in the middle to kind of kickstart uh, that settlement. And then they're also laying down these bees mats with oysters attached in Mosquito Lagoon. Uh, the University of Central Florida has constructed some bees mat reefs next to uh, the sort of traditional Naltex mat reefs, and they'll be comparing uh, those two 
materials to each other. Um, those were just deployed in the last few months over the summer. So, you know, we'll be seeing those results in the next um, in the next year or so. The next material that we're starting to see applied in different areas are Community Oyster Reef Enhancement Modules, or CORE modules. These are developed by the Whitney Lab at University of Florida, and it's a semi-biodegradable uh, base, so it's cement mixed with um, pine bark and hay and, and different organic materials. And the idea is that those organic materials will biodegrade over time and create interstitial space for fouling organisms over the lifespan of this unit. So um, it, it almost um, gets more space for colonization you know, as it ages. And then there are oyster shells embedded into the top uh, as cult. And they've deployed several reefs uh, near the Whitney Lab and had really great success with recruitment and growth. Uh, and then this, this top picture here is from a site where the core modules were uh, deployed in April in Nassau County, and this picture was just a few weeks ago, um, af just after Hurricane Dorian, and these units had only been in the water for four months. So uh, again, there were only 10 blank shells put in there, and you can just see some, some really great oyster growth on these units. So there's, there's some potential here. These obviously have a fairly low profile, um, but they still involve some of that community participation uh, and have a sort of a mixture of organic and, um, and cement materials. Core modules are also being placed in Mosquito Lagoon in Volusia County, and you can see in this picture, they're being placed right next to Naltex mesh bags, so part of that monitoring will include some comparison between those two, um, those two methods. So those were put in in August and will be monitored through the next year. A similar kind of unit uh, was developed by Valdosta State University and Florida State University. And these are a limestone silicate with stearic acid base. Some of them were infused with a proprietary blend of nutrients, and some of them included uh, some culture material, blank shell embedded into the top, similar to those core modules. So the take home from this project was the nutrients did not seem to make much of a difference. The culture material did make a difference. So um, the staff involved in that project shared with me that, you know, one of the trade-offs there was that these blocks were a little bit difficult for volunteers to handle and move around and a little challenging to secure to the substrate. Um, so again, just some considerations there. But they did have uh, some success with oyster growth on the LSS blocks with Colch uh, included. And I know I'm racing through these um, these projects, but uh, there's just a lot of information to go through, and I really just want to give everybody a taste of these, and I'll have my contact information at the end if you want to be connected with folks on a particular project uh, or have a more specific question. So I'm just giving you the, um, the broad view here. We worked with the company that created or, or utilizes the bees mask quite a bit and said, you know, we also need a bagging material that's similar to this Naltex mesh, mesh, uh, mesh material. So they came up with a fiber bag uh, made of cellulose. This is a biodegradable material. Um, they created the same dimensions as those Naltex bags. And so we uh, deployed several of those along traditional Naltex bag reefs at, at two locations, one in Brevard County and one in Volusia County. These are moderate energy intertidal sites. And unfortunately, at both sites, those bags completely disintegrated in less than a month. So um, we didn't, that's not quite enough time to get the reef established and we're back to the drawing board there and, and hoping we can try some different materials. Similarly in St. Lucie County, uh, they were working with a company um, and using these Aonalex bags. Uh, these again are bio-based and biodegradable in both aerobic and anaerobic conditions, but those bags just didn't hold up long enough for that reef to get established before um, they disintegrated. Uh, so we did not see much luck with uh, either of those materials. Several projects in Florida have used core fiber bags. And I know in the past years, folks have had trouble with core fiber 
when it gets wet, the weave loosens and shell has kind of spilled out. Um, and so there's been some tweaking and adjustment over the years. Um, but, but these are two projects where we're really seeing some promising results. In St. Andrew Bay, in the Panhandle, these are subtidal reefs. This is quite a large uh, footprint project. There's four acres of reef that were restored total. These are large crescent-shaped reefs with bagged oyster shell around the perimeter and loose oyster shell in the middle. Um, so this enables a much larger scale project. And what they saw through their monitoring, which is still ongoing, um, is that that reef height initially decreased, things kind of settled, but then it stabilized and they've recorded um, a few dozen species using these reefs and, and good settlement on both the bag shell and the loose shell. So this is, a, a, again, a subtidal environment. In Sarasota Bay, they were able to use core fiber in, um, some, on some intertidal reefs. And these are circular reefs. You can see in this top right photo, that dark perimeter around the edge, those are the core fiber bags and there's loose shell in the middle. So these are about 20 foot diameter and um, they saw a similar kind of sloughing of that edge, a initial settlement of those bags. The bags held together for um, at least the first growing season, had some good recruitment. Um, and they're seeing some promising results there. So this may be an option that, that warrants further testing in other areas. Uh, we've seen some success in both subtitle and intertidal uh, applications in Florida. At Wright's Landing at the GTM Research Reserve, the uh, core logs were placed along the shoreline in conjunction with mesh bag reefs and uh, planting. So you can see here, in the photograph, those mesh bag units and then the core logs behind it, and then the plantings uh, even behind those. This project, uh, there were a lot of lessons learned about materials. It's a really high energy shoreline with a large fetch. Uh, they had issues with shipworms chewing through the stakes. Those core logs got um, destroyed in less than a month. And they found out, unfortunately, that the company that sold them the core logs did not disclose that there was a monofilament structure underneath the core. So there were some uh, cleanup efforts required. What they're seeing now, after about five years, those mesh bags are starting to deteriorate. So they're losing um, oyster coverage. So this site's getting revisited, um, but again, a lot of lessons learned there um, from those different materials. Core fiber is also used on these oyster mattresses. This is in St. Andrew Bay. Um, as part of that project I mentioned earlier. So again, these are subtitle reefs, fairly low energy. And this is a way to cover a little bit more square footage. Uh, so these are kind of large, uh, you know, layers of core fiber with oyster shell sprinkled in there and then topped with more core fiber. The whole thing can kind of be rolled up, transported to the site, and then unrolled as a big mattress. For this particular project, um, the profile of these mattresses was not sufficient to outpace um, some of the accretion happening and some of the sedimentation. Um, so the issue may have been more with design rather than material, um, but that's why I kind of have this in the maybe category. Um, they, again, this core fiber lasted through a growing season, at, at least one, but they had issues with um, these getting buried. This was a project summary I received from Upper Newport Bay in California. They used core fiber bagged shell in conjunction with eelgrass planting um, at a site. And they had um, several treatments uh, and found that, you know, that the bagged oysters did well. They had significant increases in oysters and eelgrass as compared to the control, and that it was um, beneficial to use those two uh, in tandem with each other. There's also been some exploration of using limestone as a uh, culture material as opposed to shell bags. So in Palm Beach County, they have applied limestone at multiple sites. These are typically high to moderate energy sites. And they see um, pretty good oyster recruitment and survival seems to be site dependent. What they found through some trial and error is that this four inch to six, nine inch stone is really good for mimicking the low profile reefs that would be found in this region. And they hold up better than oyster bags. They said they, they had some issues with oyster bags deteriorating. Um, and that really, they get more interstitial space from these stones. You know, you've got um, the underside of these stones. 
some nooks and crannies in between them that you don't necessarily get from these bags that kind of settle in together and lock each other in place. So they have a few other sites planned um, to continue testing this in Palm Beach County. We saw similar results in Choctahatchee Bay and the Panhandle, a moderate wave energy site that just needed a little bit more structure there to protect the shoreline, and they are seeing good recruitment on these limestone, um, limestone uh, breakwaters. Several groups are testing crab traps. So these are derelict crab traps that are um, usually salvaged from rodeos and um, you know different trap roundups, and they're adjusted so that they're no longer fishing, and then they're coated with a cement slurry to encourage oyster settlement. And this has been attempted in uh, Nassau County, and it, this is deployed in April, so it's fairly young. And what they're finding is this doesn't necessarily get around our plastic problem because a lot of crab traps are actually coated in plastic. Uh, that makes the cement slurry a little bit challenging to stick. Um, and they are really seeing varied recruitment. So they have these units of six crab traps together, and some of the crab traps will be covered in oysters and some really have none. And they haven't really teased out um, you know, what's causing that variation. It doesn't seem to be the plastic coating necessarily. They all get the same cement slurry. Uh, so there are some variables there uh, that they're that they're trying to understand through continued monitoring. Uh, there's also some collaboration at University of North Florida between the biology department and the construction materials department. So they're looking to develop some different composite materials and, and cement um, mixtures that really mimic the oyster signature at the at the restoration site. Uh, and whether that's used for coating crab traps or, you know, building a different type of structure, uh, they're really looking to explore that in the next few years and, and have applied to a few funding sources to, to do so. We see uh, cement composites. This is from the Sandbar Oyster Company, and this is a mixture of uh, cement and jute. And these kind of scaffolding structures can be built specific to your site needs so they can cover fairly large areas and be built to varying heights and shapes. Um, this one in particular was deployed at the FSU Coastal Marine Lab and uh, was deployed just this summer so so results pending um, but this is also if you'll see on the right side of your screen in the purple pictures this is just a small snippet of the projects going on in North Carolina. Uh, that utilize this material. And um, if you're interested in that, I encourage you to reach out to the, the Sandbar Oyster Company. They're testing these structures in a variety of conditions, and uh, you can see some of the oyster settlement and growth um, at some of these different sites shown here. So a number of sites in North Carolina uh, where this is being tested. The bottom picture, this is another uh, composite experiment from UNF. This is a mixture of oyster shells and cement kind of formed into like a cinder block uh, type shape. And uh, there's been some experimentation on how to, how to best utilize those and what recruitment and growth looks like on, on something like that. One thing with cement composites is, um, you know, cement is very carbon intensive to create. So um, that's one of the trade-offs of using that material. Um, and depending on your involvement of the community, I know a lot of people rely on volunteers. Um, that may or may not be possible given the, the type of cement structure that you use. Uh, logistics can be a little bit more complicated when, um, when talking about these kinds of structures. So again, there's always trade-offs, and that's part of the, the conversation I hope that this encourages. We've also seen some really interesting project where people are really thinking outside the box. This is a living dock in Palm Beach County. In the top right photograph, you can see an aerial image of that dock, and most of the little living pockets of this dock are vegetated. So they have mangroves, they have grasses, and then that one farthest out on the dock is actually a little oyster reef. And that's what's pictured here. There are open mesh sides and perforated aluminum that allow water flow through, and then loose shell was put in here. So the elevation is dropped a, a foot or two below. It took a little bit of trial and error, but um, Palm Beach County and Michael Singer Studio, uh, who developed this design, were able to make sure that there was sufficient water flow and um, elevation to, to have a nice living reef here. So you see 
uh, some a little snapper using that area. And this is a really cool wildlife viewing opportunity that also allows for um, some oyster growth and a, and a little mini reef to grow. Palm Beach County in particular is uh, has a lot of hardened shoreline, and so this is sort of a creative way to um, get some oyster habitat while working with this um, you know heavily altered uh, landscape along the shoreline. There's also a, a fairly new program from Florida Gulf Coast University called Rink to Reef. And this was born from their hockey team, realizing that they break many, many, many sticks per, uh, per season. And what, what other use could these sticks be applied for uh, rather than just sent to the landfill? So their um, marine station staff helped them build these Lincoln log structures out of uh, broken hockey sticks. And they can hang these off of docks and, and create some habitat for filter feeding vertebrates. They've uh, deployed a few off of docks in the last few months and had good initial success uh, with settlement of oysters and, and other filter feeders. So this is uh, sort of an interesting project that we'll see evolve over the next few years, I believe. So again, people getting very creative with, uh, with their alternative materials for, for oyster restoration. So again, I'm, I'm just scratching the surface here, and, and a lot of these projects are, are Florida-focused. I had to pare it down a bit to um, fit it into a short discussion, but I really just wanted to give an update on some of the projects going on, where are we, what's going on, um, you know, what are some ideas being explored and the trade-offs involved, and I think the answer to the question is, yes, we can build oyster reefs and stabilized shorelines. Uh, without a, a plastic foundation, but there are going to be trade-offs, um, and we definitely need more research and, and more experimentation. Things that work in one area might not work in another. Um, you have to consider your goals, both short-term and long-term. Are you trying to increase water filtration, or are you, are you trying to restore a particular oyster reef that's been damaged? Are you trying to create fisheries habitat? You know, and that might help you balance some of these trade-offs. Um, to consider with these various alternatives. So my email is there. I would love to get more information about your projects that you have going on and maybe some things that you've tried. I'd love to hear from you all if we have time for some discussion. Um, again, I, I'm sure there's other other ideas and, and information out there. So I'd love to open it up and um, hear from all of you on on what's going on. Thank you. Wonderful, Annie. That was fantastic. Um, and I encourage everybody um, to to think creatively, uh, not only about their living shorelines, but um, how many cool um, Marvin Gaye songs they incorporate into their title. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so now is uh, your chance, uh, the participants, to ask questions or comments or um, and like, just to, to repeat what I had said earlier, if you um, want to ask a question or, or make a comment to the group directly, use the control panel and virtually raise your hand and I will unmute you. Um, alternatively, use the control panel and submit a question um, and uh, that has already occurred. Okay, so question from the group, Annie. Um, have you heard of anyone trying the new PLA, polylactic acid material, being manufactured by Filtrex? We're trying to get some samples for our projects in Galveston Bay. Any any feedback oh, on it that? Would help if I un it would help if I unmuted myself. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard of the PLA material. I do not know of any specific projects um, that have it in the water at this time. So if anybody, I don't know if anybody else on on the call has um, has different information. All right. Anybody out there? Filtrex polylactic acid. All right. If if you do have some and are just feeling shy, uh, shoot me an email and I will get that information out to the person who asked. Okay. So um, another question, uh, Annie. So I know you know right here in, on your last um, slide, you talk about you know there's all kinds of trade-offs. I think one of the the big one once people say I don't want to use plastic, 
um, one of the big ones is how much is this going to cost? Um, and you know, yeah, you knew this was coming, right? So, um, Mm -hmm. in, in large scale, of course, it's hard to say, well, this one is super cheap and this one is, you know, uh, more expensive, but you know, in general terms, um, what have you noticed in terms of comparing some of these? Yes. And you notice I did not include cost on any of these projects. (laughs) Um, as if we can pretend that that's not something that drives, you know, sometimes drives how large we can we can work on a space. So uh, some of these materials are quite costly, especially if there's a, a proprietary um, material involved. You know, if one company makes it, then, um, you know, these things can get expensive. Some of the materials themselves lend themselves to be able to cover larger Spaces, um, you know, things like core fiber are, are fairly inexpensive. Um, I don't have much information about cost on some of the um, jute and cement scaffolding materials. Um, and even like the bees units, which those are made from a byproduct of another industry, but they have to be processed in a way to make them, uh, you know, in that clickable layered matrix. And those are rather expensive. So doing a bees project on a large scale would be uh, costly. So it's certainly something we have to think about. And it it may be something that changes as we shift our practices. If we start leaning on certain materials, you know, the market may, may respond to that a little bit and cost could change. Um, but, but that is an, a consideration, certainly, depending on the scale of your project. Gotcha. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Um, another question has come in, um, and it is, what are the trade-offs and safety issues in selling other materials using rebar and metal? I think the implication that I'm reading from this one is, uh, you know, as opposed to plastic or some other things. So um, what are what are some of the other issues that come um, from using rebar and metal? Yes, and... Um, not only that, but it, when we start getting into some of the larger scale projects, you know, at what point do you shift from, you know, a volunteer-based um, installation of an oyster restoration project to a staff only to a contractor? Um, and, and again, those are part of the trade-offs. So the plastic materials, you know, pretty much anyone can handle them. You get a lot of community volunteer hours. Um, but yeah, you have to think about materials that could injure people or cause reactions or something like that Uh, and then also uh, deployment you know if you're doing a large-scale loose shell deployment and and large-scale core bags you know you may just need a contractor on a barge um, and let them handle their insurance and, and liability and that sort of thing so scale is important in talking about safety and and also um yeah safety uh, I'm sorry, materials uh, and safety can go hand in hand. So certainly a consideration depending on who's doing the construction materials and who's doing the installation of materials. Gotcha. Thank you. And here is a comment that has come in. The Sarasota Bay Oyster Reef Project used plastic oyster bags to form a ring of oyster bags and then filled it with loose shell. And this worked very well. That sounds similar to the the project you did with the core fiber circular reefs. Okay, um, sorry, getting back. While minimizing the amount of plastic going into the environment, hoping that there's other alternatives, but this solution reduced the amount of plastic being placed into the environment. So another another kind of comment on that. Um, and I did have a question yes, about and that. If I can... um, cor- okay, yeah, please do. Yeah, I was going to chime in. That's that, and that's a great you know, an alternative to these alternatives is just can we can we still use these plastic materials? We know that they're successful in a lot of applications, but can we just use fewer of them? And maybe that's um as this person mentioned, or it's something like our our base layer of material is rock and then we top that rock with a layer of, you know, plastic oyster bags. But at least we've cut out two thirds of the of the plastic on those under layers that may not be at the right elevation for oyster growth anyway. So you know, be creative about combining materials or, again, yeah, using loose shell in, um, inside the a stable perimeter uh, as a way to just reduce that 
total amount of plastic in a project. So I think that's a really good point, and I appreciate that being brought up. Alrighty, thank you on that one, uh, both for the comment and Annie for your response. Um, the core fiber circular reef that you um, showed, one of the questions that I personally had, um, I know, I, I think, in this part of Florida where you ha where it was deployed, um, there's not a huge tidal range. Um, I was curious as to what the reef height was in the middle of that circle, because I know in certain areas, not only is sedimentation a problem, in other words, not Florida, but elsewhere, but also reef height in general is, is a really big issue. So do you have any information on what the, that reef height was for the core fiber circular reef? I don't have specifics. If there's a Sarasota Bay um, estuary program person on here, they may have some more detail. Um, okay. So I don't know if they. All right, we'll throw that back and out to the group. I can always connect group. this person. Yeah, I can always connect this person with um, with the contacts if need be to answer some of those more detailed questions. Gotcha. All right. So the questions are coming in. Mm -hmm. I told you this would happen. This is a very me. hot topic. <laughs> I know. It's been really amazing that the um, once the conversation gets going, because yep, yeah, there are you know site specific issues, material specific issues, safety issues as we're hearing. It's, it's, there's a lot of trade-offs. There's a lot going on. <laughs> All right. So one of the questions was, um, could you please have any comment on the permitting challenges of some of these materials and locations? Federal group, excuse me, federal groups don't like metal, metal or rebar. Um, oh, I'm, I, so I think the comment is some federal groups don't like metal or rebar in a permitting context. Um, you know, another example is Florida Aquatic Preserves don't allow concrete larger than six inches, et cetera, et cetera. So what are some of the permitting issues that, that you have heard about and um, maybe potential solutions for getting around them? Yes, yeah, so many living shorelines and some oyster projects um, can fall under, um, you know, permit exemption criteria. But part of that is includes the materials that you use, and they want to make sure that the materials involved in an exemption are materials that are proven to be effective. So if you're trying something new that's not been proven to be effective, you typically have to go through a slightly longer and more complicated permitting process. Um, so that's one challenge. Uh, and those safeguards are in place for a reason. Obviously, we don't want people just plunking whatever the heck they want out there and, and calling it an oyster reef. Um, but but that's just another level. Um, there's also, that can come up with funding as well. Um, some funding uh, sources want to support materials with a proven track record, and it can be a little bit harder to find financial support for trying something new that you may or may not have to remove uh, in a year or two if it doesn't work out. Um, given our limited funding, um, environment, it's, uh, you know, that's something to consider. So um, part of the solution to these permitting challenges is um, keeping the permitters involved in this conversation. You mentioned earlier our Northeast Estuarine Restoration Team, and one of the most powerful parts of that group has been that the permitters are part of that. And so as we're having all these discussions as a restoration community about challenges and issues and potential solutions, you know, they're there at the table as well, and they're telling us, okay, but here's, you know, here's what we want to make sure from our permitting standpoint. And then as we start to come up with alternatives that have some potential and might be able to um, take the place of some of these plastic materials, you know, they can help incorporate that into uh, the permitting process and, and make those processes a little bit smoother for materials that have a bit more um, evidence behind their success. Uh, so I would say just keep keep our permitters involved in this conversation and um, you know don't get discouraged <laughs> when trying something new. If if it takes a little bit more effort to convince folks that it's worth trying. Great, thank you. Another question has come in. Um, so Annie, do you have thoughts on using recycled fishing or shrimp nets? in place of the plastic mesh bags. In this case, they will be cut down to size and made into bags that can hold about 30 pounds of shell. 
Hmm. I think this is this has come up uh, in some other discussions about this, and not that specific material actually, but the idea of okay, is it better to use a material that already exists and maybe thrown out otherwise and might go sit in a landfill? Um, you know, should we put that to good use in the marine environment, even if there might be some, you know, detrimental impacts of putting more plastics in the marine environment? Or is it better to create a material that that is better suited, uh, you know, but but in creation of that material, there are carbon emissions or transportation challenges or whatever the case may be. So uh, I personally don't feel that it's my place to, you know, to necessarily judge these things and say one is better than the other. But certainly as a community, uh, that's something we should discuss. And whether, you know, this idea like recycling, recycling the hockey sticks, you know, if, if that's the best use for them at this stage in their life, um, yeah, maybe that is better than, than going to the landfill, or maybe that's a material we don't really want in the marine environment and we need to think about um, the impacts of that. So uh, I think that's a really good point is considering this idea of upcycling uh, materials um, that might otherwise get thrown out. Love it. We just need to, to have Instagrammers have take that on as a as a hip new thing, and we'll figure all these problems out. <laughs> um, so uh, a question about that living dock, which was fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. So there, so there's a sort of encasement for that mesh kind of structure that is below the dock. What kind of maintenance, or do you know? I mean, or, I mean, I would assume that, assuming it's 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 successful. Um, mm -hmm. Oysters are going to have to be taken out of there, or like what? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like what? What's the? Do you happen to know the long-term maintenance plans for that? Yeah, I had this very question for um, Palm Beach County and the Michael Singer Studio staff, who um, kind of sent this information to me, and they said the first few years it took a little bit of maintenance and it took some adjusting. They had issues with not getting sufficient water flow through there, so things were kind of getting clogged up, um, and then they had to adjust. Um, for better elevation for those oysters. Um, so they did some tweaks and they said, since they've done those tweaks in the last, you know, four or five years, they've really had minimal to no maintenance on this living dock structure, that it's, it's sort of self-sustaining and um, seems to be doing very well. Um, I asked about, you know, is there potential for this being sort of like an oyster garden where you harvest uh, oysters out of there? and maybe transplant them to another site so this becomes sort of a little grow out nursery almost. Um, and unfortunately, we, we didn't get that far in the discussion. I didn't get an answer uh, before this presentation. But, but yeah, my thinking was on the same, on the same vein of, uh, hey, this could be kind of a cool little, little grow out nursery. Um, but they said it's, uh, again, it's had very little maintenance needs since they got that water flow and elevation correct. Interesting. Yeah, so it's sort of like an, like you said, an oyster gardening project, just on a very large scale, um, in terms mm -hmm. of how big it could be conceivably. Well, that's fascinating. And it's been really, um, it's been really um, a great tool for uh, school groups. I've done a lot of projects with that living dock. Um, there's been a PhD student who did quite a bit of research on the various species utilizing that habitat. So it's also been, you know, not only a public outreach tool for anybody walking along that dock, but, um, you know, a, a great place to do different experiments and um, education programs. Now, is there signage on there, on the living dock? Uh, I do not know. I did not see any in the photographs, but um, I have not visited in person. I'm not sure. Okay. that's okay. I, I was just thinking along that lines of, of outreach and community mm -hmm. awareness. I mean, I would think that some signage could be um, fascinating. Um, well, I think, let's see, uh, last call for questions or comments for Annie. All right, I think we've answered them all for this time period. For now. So mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, oh, see, someone beat me. Oh, and, and people are saying thank you to Annie. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna go ahead and take the screen back.
Um, and uh, so, Annie, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, and uh, as a reminder, uh, this is being recorded. We will get it up on our Ray YouTube channel. For more information, there are all of our smiling faces. There is Annie and Hillary and myself. Our next community of practice gathering will be November 20th. Um, we have not quite lined anybody up to the best of my knowledge, um, and we are always looking for speakers and topics, so um, please get in touch with Hillary with um, some ideas or if you would like to speak. On that note, it has been an honor and a privilege to um, host these, and I look forward to uh, continuing to work with you in my new, um, my, with my new responsibility. So again, Annie, thank you very much. And um, we will reconvene in November. Thank you so much and have a great day. Take care.